He saw Thomas reach into his waistband as though he was grabbing for a gun. Thomas was not armed, and the fuse was burning toward an explosion. We're tired of being tired. Monday afternoon, Thomas's family, pastor, and family attorney took their outrage questions and 200 supporters to City Hall. You can't talk, we're in a recess. Thomas's mother, Angela Leacher, demanded <laughs> answers. I demand to know why. The answer she received, not enough. By the end of the question is asked exactly what the officer did say. That material was turned over to the grand jury. The contentious meeting ended with the crowd spilling out into the street. By evening, protesters gathered at police headquarters. Cincinnati police, in riot gear, responded. But Monday night showdown was only a prelude. April 10th, protesters, activists, and rioters were out in force. Police clashed with rioters. By nightfall, the desperate situation turned into anarchy. Violent clashes, arsons, vandalism continued for days. The police regained control of the streets Friday the 13th with an overwhelming show of force, a citywide curfew, and a break in the record high temperatures. In the aftermath, came change. Instead of looking back, let's look forward. Instead of looking at blame, let's look at fixing the problem. Cincinnati leaders signed the historic collaborative agreement. It lasted until July of 2008 and led to changes in virtually all aspects of policing in Cincinnati. The collaborative led to revolutionary programs such as the Cincinnati Initiative to Reduce Violence. So successful, it's been held up as a model for other cities. And I think people's skepticism will lessen as they see the agreement come to life. April 2001 remains a watershed moment for Cincinnati. While scars remain, hope emerges. But we are left to ask, what progress have we made? And what is left to do? Hi, I'm Gabe Gottlieb. I'm the director of Xavier's Ethics, Religion, and Society program. And I'm also an assistant professor of philosophy here. It's my honor to welcome you tonight. We have a packed program, so really I want to be brief. Putting together an event like tonight's town hall requires the efforts of many folks. I'd like to thank a few people who were really essential in, in helping out tonight, a couple programs. Uh, first, I'd like to thank President, the President's Office, Father Graham, uh, for his gener generous support for tonight's e program. I also want to thank James Buchanan and Cynthia Cummins from the Brueggemann Center, Sean Riney from the Eichel Center for Community Engaged Learning, and Taj Smith and Kyra Shahid and the folks involved at the Center for Diversity and Inclusion. All of you were essential in putting tonight together. Thanks also to Kelly Leon and Roxanne Qualls, as well as Cheryl Johnson, Chief Milik, Sean Comer, the Black Student Association. I also want to thank a few people who helped in um, organizing and presenting at some lead-up events we had for students. In particular, Judge Susan DeLott, Iris and Jesse Rowley, and everyone involved in the pre-events that led up to tonight's main event. Finally, I'd like to thank all of you for being here, taking the time to come out uh, and to think seriously about the past, but also about the future. Tonight's town hall offers us a chance to reflect on two essential and intertwined questions, community, police relations, and economic inclusiveness. No doubt many of us will vary in our understanding of 2001, the aftermath, the success of the collaborative agreement, the current status of policing, the sources of crime, and the well-being of our city and res its residents. I invite all of you to think rigorously and respectfully about tonight's themes, the views of our panelists, as well as the remarks of each other. We come together <coughs> in a spirit of dialogue with the aim of deepening our mutual understanding. Please join me for some opening remarks by Father Michael Graham. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. 
it's an incredible delight to look out here and see all of you um, good, big-hearted people from the region who seek to make this community a better place. Uh, about a year ago, we started thinking about what it is that we might do here uh, in light of uh, April's anniversary, and I'm very grateful uh, to Gabe Gottlieb uh, for uh, really taking this on with such passion and energy. I think we owe Gabe a big round of applause. Gabe, thank you. There are also a number of individuals here I'd like to uh, recognize. Uh, Cecil Thomas, uh, Judge Fanon Rucker, Judge Tracy Hunter, Eileen Cooper-Reed, Chief Elliot Isaac, uh, Judge Susan DeLotte, whose name has already been mentioned, her husband, Stan Chesley, Denise Treehouse, Rob Reifsteiner, Tim Burke. Um, I, reading names is always such a risky thing because you will risk omitting a name, and I, so I apologize if, if uh, I should have read your name and did not. But really, to each and every person who is sitting here, uh, because many of you were in place uh, as you could be engaged, and so hats off to you, even though I don't know what your name is. <laughs> I've been president of Xavier. Yes, thank you. You all deserve a round of applause. Thank you. I've been the president of Xavier University um, for about three and a half months by the time the riots happened. Uh, and for me, it was a real game changer. I knew that either things were going to be different going forward or they were not going to be different. And I knew that the right answer to that was that things should be different, but to know that they should be different is not to know exactly how or what it is that you should do going forward. And so I knew that becoming more engaged in the community myself and, be and having the university become more engaged with the community uh, was a first step. Uh, because we are a Jesuit and a Catholic university, we have a moral place um, to operate from, and so that kind of involvement comes only uh, naturally. Uh, so Xavier, like all kinds of organizations, uh, stepped up back in the days of 2001, answered Charlie Lucan's call uh, to see how, what it was that we might do uh, to help uh, improve police community relations, the criminal justice system, but also all the background situations that help to create the explosive mix in Cincinnati, um, issues ranging from health care to education and the like. It was some of the hardest and most important work, I think, that I've ever been engaged in, uh, specific, specifically as one of the co-chairs for that commission on the police uh, in the community and the criminal justice system. Many of you here in this room, as I said, remember those days very, very well. Uh, how was that you turned your TV on uh, or sort of looked out your window and saw your neighborhood, uh, your city transformed into something you never could have imagined? Many of you were not here. You've come here from wherever it was you were back then. Some of you were just kids at that time. Um, but even those of you who were not old enough to remember the events in Cincinnati back then, uh, no names like Ferguson or Chicago or Baltimore and so on, where events like we had back in 2001 are altogether uh, too frequent uh, here nationally. So it's those events, both here and far away, that form the context of our conversation tonight and remind us that our work is never really done. You know, the, uh, the video ended with this um, uh, quote um, about how um, much has been done and yet don't things remain to be done. My own take is we did a lot of good work back in 2001. That's almost as nothing, and that's not to put that work down compared to the work that remains in front of us to do going forward. And so the future, the future, thank you, is really where our focus must be tonight uh, by way of reflecting on our past. For the past couple of weeks, our students have been reflecting in a whole series of events on these events from uh, 2001, getting a bit up to speed, learning some of the nomenclature, what a collaborative agreement was, and so on. We're going to begin tonight um, by sort of jumping into the middle of the situation, if you will. Uh, someone who can provide some first-hand context of um, uh, 2001 from his own very important perspective. And so we're privileged to have former mayor uh, Charlie Lucan uh, with us. Uh, Charlie was mayor from 1983 to 1991, and then again from 1999 to 2005, which makes him the longest-serving mayor in the history of the good city of Cincinnati. Uh, he also served as a U.S. congressman for a while and today works at a local law firm. In response to the riots back then, Mayor Lucan formed uh, something called the Community Action Now Commission, known as CAN. 
and that supported efforts which led to a whole variety of reforms in the area of race relations and ultimately led to the signing of the collaborative agreement. Other elements that came forward from there are success by six, the Minority Business Accelerator, other initiatives that continue to do their good work. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the honorable former, ma former mayor of Cincinnati, Charlie Lucan. Thank you, Father Graham, and to Xavier University, thank you for hosting tonight. It's an amazing crowd, and who's ever doing this, Father, uh, has done a super job. Uh, in, in both of my terms as mayor, uh, I got to serve with uh, people from Xavier, Father Hoff, Father Graham, and in my opinion, I got to see two of the best, and Xavier's always been a great asset to our community and involved in just about everything that goes on, so thank you. Uh, I was reminded tonight by one of the organizers of the event that m most of the students at Xavier were, quote, very little children <laughs> when the riots happened in 2001, and whether um, you're a student or whether a little older like me, it's good to pause and remember and look forward. Uh, what happened in 2001? This is just my quick view. Our community, including me, was slow to grasp the depths of legitimate complaint. When citizens demand change, when they deserve change, when they petition for change, and people in power do not respond, or do not listen, then it is the history of America, it is the history of democracy, that people will protest and engage sometimes in civil unrest. Uh, prior generations have spoken about it. Thomas Jefferson said we need some revolution every few years. Frederick Douglass said, nothing changes without demand, and he underscored the word, nothing. Martin Luther King's words about civil unrest and protest are uh, legendary in our country. So while I don't condone violence, what happened in 2001 was part of American tradition. And I would argue, by and large, healthy American tradition. At a point, sometimes we are all reluctant to admit, and I'm going to be careful how I say this. Without the civil unrest of 2001, the progress and change in our city and the dramatic nature of the change would have been less. It's hard sometimes to acknowledge that something like what happened in 2001 has made us better but I believe that it did. The next four or five years after that were very tough. Some of your panelists who I work with and, and bless them all for continuing to work for our city in the name of making our city better. You know, we argued uh, on occasion, Pastor, and uh, sometimes there was anger and it was, things got a little rough. But in the end, we came to a better place. And now people around the country, uh, they'll call Pastor Lynch or Iris, or they'll call me, and they'll go, how did you do that? It might be Ferguson or Chicago, or, you know, they all, they all call. And uh, we can take some pride in that. But we should not be smug in our celebration. Most of the root causes of the civil unrest in 2001 still exist today. My hope is that we take these anniversaries and use them uh, not mostly to celebrate the past, but to look forward uh, in a spirit of working together in progress. And maybe, just maybe, if we listen to the good panelists tonight and some of the good people in the room, maybe we won't have the jolting awakening that we all experienced in 2001. Thank you for the invitation. I look forward to your panelists. It's my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce to you uh, our moderator for this evening, Ms. Donna Jones-Baker. Uh, Donna has been the uh, CEO of our 
uh, of the Urban League of Southwestern Ohio since 2003, so she wasn't around exactly uh, what everything um, happened, uh, but very quickly became engaged um, in a variety of initiatives that were designed to help move the community forward as a result of it, and has continued that good service. Um, she has uh, led that, um, uh, led the Urban League here for the last 13 years, and I'm very pleased to say she's likewise a member of the Xavier University Board of Trustees. So uh, please greet my boss, um, <laughs> Trustee Donna Jones-Baker, who will moderate our panel for this evening and who will take us into the heart of the conversation. Donna. His boss. Yeah, right. <laughs> I understand that we have a capacity crowd here this evening. That shows how important this issue is to a whole lot of people. Welcome to Xavier University. This event, this opportunity to have this retrospective um, is a courageous move during a period of time that the university really could have ignored. And I want to say thank you, Father Graham, for having the courage to reflect on that issue. And also how it continues to inform our agenda and our actions today. So Father Graham, you're right. I moved to Cincinnati in November of 2003. I was here for two weeks and went to visit family back in Baltimore, where I came here from and um, for, for Thanksgiving. And on my way back to Cincinnati, Valerie Lemmy, the then city manager, called me to inform me of a major disturbance. It seems that one Nathaniel Jones, a black man, had been beaten to death by a police officer in the middle of a White Castle parking lot. News video of the incident played over and over and over again, showing him falling to the ground, screaming in pain. While he was being beaten, he was being asked to put your hands behind your back. We had not learned the lesson in 2003. And on July 19, 2015, Samuel DeBose, was stopped on a city street by a University of Cincinnati police officer, detained and shot to death within, min within a matter of minutes. For what the officer states was Mr. DeVos's intent to hurt him. Within two weeks, the county prosecutor convened a grand jury, brought forth an indictment against the officer for murder. We mourn the death of Mr. DeVos. There is no reason that he should have died. In many respects, even given all of our successes with the collaborative agreement, we still don't have it right. In my opinion, if the agreement was good enough for CPD and the citizens of Cincinnati, it should be good enough for any and all police agencies in Cincinnati, including our universities and Hamilton County Sheriff's yeah. Department. you've seen the video and you've heard bits and pieces of this before, but I've been asked just to set it up once again. So for a moment, as difficult as it is, let's return to 2001 and the events leading up to the violence that Cincinnati experienced. There are names and circumstances that will remain in our collective memories for decades, if not forever. Lorenzo Collins, a UC hospital psychiatric patient threatened police with a brick. He died five days after being shot several times by CPD. Roger Owensby Jr., a young unarmed black man who was detained on the suspicion of being a drug dealer, although no drugs were ever found on him. He died in the back of a police cruiser and Timothy Thomas, a teenager who had several misdemeanor offenses, was shot while trying to flee a Cincinnati police officer and whose death ignited the firestorm of protest on April 19, 2001. 
in addition to the deaths of the 15 black men over a five-year period, and please note, a period where no white person in Cincinnati died in police custody. There were also major tensions around economic disparities and the lack of jobs and overall economic opportunity for African Americans. The collaborative agreement, though, was a true collaborative effort. Most of us know that the Black United Front was involved. Yeah. <laughs> the Boycott Council. That's right. The Boycott Council was comprised of three organizations. The Black United Front, Concerned Citizens for Justice, and the Coalition, I hear some applause, and the Coalition for a Just Cincinnati. I know that Iris is going to talk more about this tonight. <laughs> She's already talking. <laughs> but there were over 3,500 people who were surveyed to gather data on what citizens thought they, what citizens felt they wanted in their police department. I'm going to cover the elements of the collaborative agreement. It required that participants take a collective effort to pursue five primary goals. To ensure that police officers and community members partner proactively in community problem solving. That we build relationships of trust and cooperation within and between police and communities. That there was improved CPD officer education, oversight, monitoring, hiring practices, and accountability. That we ensure fair, equitable, and courteous treatment for all. And that we create methods to establish the public's understanding of police policies and practices, and that we recognize excellence and exceptional service in an effort to, to foster more support for police as a direct result of the collaborative agreement. CPD created a mental health response team that is regularly called when citizens display behaviors that are reflecting a mental health issue. The city manager meets on a monthly basis with a citizens advisory group to monitor and to, and to evaluate all of the community police relations issues. And the citizens complaint authority reported recently that complaints against police officers were at an all-time low. This evening, you're going to get to hear from individuals who have been intimately involved with the community for a very long time. And as our panelists are talking, think about what questions that you have of them. There will be an opportunity to ask questions um, after each of the panelists have, have spoken and after we've had a question and answer session. <coughs> so let me introduce the panel to you. And as I call their names, if they would come up and have a seat, I'd appreciate it. The first is Reverend Damon Lynch the yeah. Third. is the senior pastor of New Prospect Baptist Church in Roselawn. In 2001, Reverend Lynch led a group of organizations in the filing of a class action lawsuit against racial profiling in the city of Cincinnati, which resulted in a historic landmark agreement. Since then, he's been invited to several communities to share his insight into the factors that led to the riots and unrest in 2001, as well as the collaborative process. The next person is Ms. Iris Rowley. <laughs> Iris Rowley is a native of Cincinnati, Ohio. She's a businesswoman and a community activist who helped design and monitor the Cincinnati, hmm, the Cincinnati Police Community Collaborative Agreement. As a project manager for the Black United Front, Iris executed a plan of action to collect stories from the African American community, documenting over 400 incidents of police misconduct that was the essential part of the historic collaborative agreement. Al Gerhardstein. Yeah. Al 
is a partner in the Cincinnati law firm Ger Gerhard Steen and Branch and a national legal expert on civil rights and employment matters. In 2001, Al sued the city as a part of the ACLU class action on racial profiling that established sweeping reforms on use of force, fairness in policing, citizen review of misconduct, etc. Currently, he's a part of the legal team representing the family of Sam DuBose. Yeah. And finally, Captain awesome. Maris Harold. Captain Harold is the operational commander for District 4, which represents 10 diverse Cincinnati neighborhoods. In 2001, she was an officer in Cincinnati's police force and has since worked with her department and community to develop and implement an integrated policing model within the city of Cincinnati. And for this discussion, I'd like the panelists okay, okay. to talk a little bit about two, 2001, and then, of course, okay. I'll have some, uh, some, some questions. And I'd like to begin, and I need you all to know, um, I would ordinarily call him Reverend Lynch, but we started at the beginning, and I asked if, you know, everybody, can I call you by your first name? And so this is, this is I will call him Damon. Um, would you please talk a little bit about 2001 and reflect on the importance of the collective action of a number of different groups to, so that we could establish the political will necessary for the collaborative I would love to. Good evening. It's an honor to be here. I, it in. I want to thank everybody who made this happen. Um, let me begin with a quote. There was a movie <coughs> called Suffragette. Did anybody see it? Suffragette talked about uh, the women's suffrage <coughs> and fighting for the right to vote, not only in America, but in Europe. And, and there's a quote that I love from the movie. It says this. It's from Maud Watts. It says, we break windows, we burn things, because that's the only language that men listen to. Because we, because you've beaten us and betrayed us and there's nothing else left. The inspector then says, there's nothing left but to stop you. Maud says, what are you gonna do? Lock us all up? We're in every home, we're half the human race. You can't stop us all. The inspector then says, you might lose your life before this is over. Ma says, we will win. We will win. I love that quote um, because coming out of the civil unrest of 2001, or the riots or, or the rebellion, however you characterize it, you always hear, you know, well, why do they tear up their own community? I don't understand. Why, why do they riot? And, and so I went back and I found this women's suffrage movement that everybody knows was a great thing to give women the right to vote. And they said, we break things. We break windows. We burn things. Because that's the only voice that men can understand. And so the question is always raised, well, why do they burn their own community? And I always say the word own is, is the most, probably the most important word in that question. Because they don't own any of it. I, mean, it's, it's, I, I, I don't know anybody who burns their own anything. Um, but the mayor said it, uh, Charlie Lucas said it earlier, if it were not for those days in April, uh, we would not have this great change in Cincinnati. Roger Owensby was the 14th African American killed in 1975. <coughs> On that same day, though, um, Jeffrey Irons was killed. They, two African-American men were killed in a 24-hour period by Cincinnati police. Jeffrey Irons, 13, Roger Owens, 14. No civil unrest, no collaborative agreement, no Cincinnati can, none of that great stuff that we're celebrating here today and looking back on. 13, 14, nothing. It was just business as usual. Number 15. And this is after a class action lawsuit had been filed. The lawsuit for the collaborative agreement was actually filed before Timothy Thomas was killed. But number 15, three nights of civil unrest. And at that point, the CBC, which is the business community, said, we've got to do something. At that point, everybody said, we have to do something. At that point, I got phone calls from people in Indian Hill that I didn't, didn't even know. <laughs> Damon, what can we do? Damon, Damon, what can we do? I'm like, who are you? 
Because if there was dis-ease and over the Rhine, if I was unresting over the Rhine, there's dis-ease in Indian Hill. I mean, I, I can't come to the symphony. Symphony's in over the Rhine. I can't come to the ballet. I mean, we got to fix this and fix it quick. And as much as everybody in here, probably everybody in here would say you're an advocate of nonviolent social change, the reality is there are very few movements ever that happen without some kind of violence, without some kind of major upheaval. Never. You can't, you, can, you, you can't name one. Not even the Civil Rights Movement. Not even Dr. King could stop what happened in Detroit or in Memphis. And so what brought Cincinnati to where we are, it was an unusual time in this city. It was a time when there were a number of grassroots organizations. I don't even know how that happened. There was the Black United Front, Concerned Citizens for Justice, Coalition for a Just Cincinnati, the Black Fist, Kabaka Abba and his group. I mean, all of a sudden, they just rose up from the ground, all these grassroots organizations. You still had the NAACP, you still had the Baptist Ministers Conference, you still had those quote unquote, you know, organizations you know, but what you don't know is this. At that time, Dr. Milton Hinton was the president of the NAACP. My father was the president of the Baptist Ministers Conference. They called us to a meeting, the Black United Front, and they both said, you take it. <laughs> We've been fighting this fight for I don't know how long, <clears throat> which is a sad thing because this whole idea of community and police relations, I mean, we did this in the 60s, we did it in the 2000s, we're doing it now in 2015 in Ferguson and Baltimore. It hasn't changed, it hasn't stopped. But the, the known organizations called us and said, you take it. What's important to know is that the Black United Front got started because in November of 2000, I'm sorry, in July of 2000, in this city, year 2000, during the time of the Jazz Festival, 13 downtown restaurants closed their doors and wouldn't serve black people. In Cincinnati, this is not Mississippi 1950, this is Cincinnati 2000. 13 down there, like 50,000 African Americans in the city of Cincinnati to go to a festival with money in their pockets, dressed to the nines. 13 restaurants closed their doors. They colluded not to serve African Americans in the city of Cincinnati. Cincinnati is schizophrenic. I, you know, I lost, I actually lost a lot of white friends during this time because they just, I'm, I'm sorry. All right, let me find let me find an exit point in this conversation. Because <laughs> I don't know what we're going to talk about for the rest of the night. If it's the collaborative, we'll, we'll talk about problem, process, and product. But let me say this to, to the younger people in the crowd, my son included. We will always need somebody willing to climb the flagpole. You can have everybody sitting in the room, but there will always need to be a great person. Somebody willing to climb the flagpole to get something done. That's my time. <laughs> so Iris, would you talk a little bit about the importance of having an, just ordinary citizens involved in the process? Sure. If you're the Cincinnati Black United Front and your members, please stand up. I'm going to show you what the importance is. If you're a neighbor to neighbors, if you have a hand in this process, please stand up. This is the importance of citizens being engaged in the process. To create a <laughs> also, I see our vice president in the back, Mr. Dwight Patton and Mr. Jesse Rowley. I want to say hey to you all. <laughs> the importance of the power of the people and the will of the people. I, I need to do one thing. Former Mayor Charlie Lucan, you were wrong. The signing of the collaborative agreement was done in federal court and Judge Susan's the lock room. It had nothing to do with the Camp Commission, I'm sorry. We spent 18 months designing that piece of, piece of work product and I want to make sure that our history is told properly because every time it's not told properly, it takes the power away from the people. The people wanted a process. The people wanted a product. That is why it's important 
for people to be engaged in the process. If you don't, then you get something that you had nothing to do with. What we have in the city of Cincinnati is what you asked for. The neighbor, the neighbors are here, and it is so beautiful to see them in their t-shirts. Because there were, how many groups? 92? How many? 43 neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor conversations going on about community and police relations going on in the city of Cincinnati and what they wanted. It wasn't just about the Black United Front. We decided to climb the pole. We were bold enough to say we were going to fix something that was broken. And we knew that it was broken for African Americans in the city of Cincinnati. That's why inside of the collaborative agreement is a class. The class reads, all African Americans are black people who are perceived as such who walk on the streets and thoroughfares of the city of Cincinnati and who come in contact with the Cincinnati Police Department and are the agents. You know why I know this thing? Because I still read it to this day. It still has relevance to people's lives. Children want to know what work product, what did the people do for them? This is what we left for them to continue to fix. That's why it's important for people to be engaged. Thank you, Iris. And so yes. I, we talked a little bit about the judicial system, <clears throat> and it played a huge role in um, actually ensuring that the agreement was, was accomplished, was finalized. Would you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, the, the court, Judge Zalat is here. Uh, we need an empire. The umpire was important because, as Charlie mentioned, we were still arguing. Even when we signed the collaborative agreement, uh, there wasn't a complete buy-in. And the court provided us with a way in which to do follow through with what we had agreed to do. Now let's talk for a minute about what that meant. Because all the other police reform agreements before or since set a very low bar. They basically say to the police, quit killing us and quit beating us up. And then they set in place um, some accountability measures, early warning systems, and uh, use of force reports and, and investigation techniques that allow for the investigation of use of force incidents. But that's still a pretty low bar. That's still just saying, quit beating us up, quit killing us. We also went a little bit further and we said there should be bias-free policing. But what does that mean? That simply means quit policing black people in a way that's unfair. Well, you would think that was already the rule of the land, but that <laughs> somehow was something we needed a court to enforce. Still, a very low bar. But what the Black United Front had brought to the legal team was a much bigger problem. It was mass incarceration. It was racism. It was the expression of oppression. It was the fact that people felt occupied in their own community by the police. How do you solve that problem? Well, not with those really low bar terms. Rather, what we did is we said, all right, let's figure out a way that we can actually have a commitment to peace, safety in the community, and reduce arrests. How can that be? That sounds like a conflict. No, it's not a conflict. It's simply a change in strategy. And we had in our midst John Eck, who's here tonight, and he was our mentor. And he taught us about the basic crime triangle, the notion that for all public unrest, for all safety problems, there's very few people that cause most of the problem. And if we can target our policing resources on the very few people, the very few locations that they work in, and the very few victims that they really interact with, then we will stop sweeps, we'll stop stop and frisk, we'll stop unfair uh, traffic enforcement, and we'll stop a lot of these strategies that, uh, stop, that, that created suspects out of citizens. And that's exactly what we tried to do in the collaborative. And we did that through something called problem solving. Problem solving says, let's collect the data and let's find out who the repeat victims are, the repeat locations, and the repeat offenders are. And let's try and focus using that data on those repeaters. And we have spent 15 years trying to implement problem solving, and we are only today really getting it done. And that's been extremely frustrating. 
We've done a lot of good strategies under the collaborative and with the court supervision until 2008, and we have actually reduced arrests. We, we met that half of the equation very well. But if you look at the percentage of black people that are still getting arrested, it's still about the same, still about 70% for felonies and misdemeanors. We've cut felony arrests in half, we've cut misdemeanor arrests in half, and that's good, and that's better than a lot of places do, but we haven't tackled that core problem. Once we get problem solving really underway, we'll have a way in which we can explain to people, I'm here because you've had 16 calls to this location for the last three weeks, and we need to get to the bottom of it, and that's a repeat location. Or I'm here in a way that you can understand and appreciate, and you'll welcome me as a police officer. So, the Sensei Collaborative is the only one with that kind of commitment to problem solving. The court helped us implement it, or at least get it started, but only today is it really getting started, and that's why Maris should go last. <laughs>
How can we interact with highway maintenance to change the traffic pattern? How can we change the lighting? How can we change you know, the, the incentives that draw criminals to that spot? Maris has worked very creatively to answer those types of questions, which often involve environmental changes and not arrests. And that's a big deal. And that's what we're really trying to improve on, because the more we can reduce crime without arrests, the less feeding of the prisons we're doing. Right. Thank you. Can I also say this, and, and that all that, and I support uh, what, what Maris is doing and, and what Al just mentioned. And those changes are necessary, but it's still, there's a racial issue here. Oh, come on. Uh, because I, you can police crime in all the correct ways, but if you still have this implicit bias against African Americans, and so you may do it the same way in, in Hyde Park as you do in Avondale, but if the racial bias is there, and there's a fear of an African American male just because he's African American male, then, because we're, I, I, I get bothered sometimes because the conversation moves from police brutality and racial profiling to crime. To crime right. And when it moves from racial profiling and police brutality right. to crime, then all of a sudden the onus is on the victim, the, victim, the person, the people. And so I think it has to, we've got to have both of those conversations. So we cannot move the conversation to just doing better policing, more scientific policing, and miss the fact that we've got to deal with the implicit bias that officers have tended to have from the moment we came to this continent. We've been running from slave catchers from day one. <laughs> running from the police is not new. We've been running from for a long time. And, and so we can have the conversation on crime, and we should, but we've also got to have the conversation on implicit bias. Right. <laughs> bit about, are there elements of the collaborative agreement that if you were negotiating today, what would you change? Yeah. Can I? May I? So if we were at the table, as we were, Father Graham, thank you so very much for allowing us to be in this fabulous institution to do the negotiations in 2001. If we were back in 2001, and we could instruct our attorneys, Al Gerhardstein, Ken Lawson, and Scott Greenwood, I would try to um, ask them to figure out how we can have a citizen's complaint authority without it being in the hands of politicians because it becomes a political thing, which I, in my opinion today, I believe it is. Um, and so if we could figure out how to make sure that the community is taken care of first, the community that was impacted in the most egregious, the most nasty, the most vile way first, as opposed to the police, because we never talk about the trauma in the black community. The trauma, the overlapping trauma time and time and time again. But we're always asked to sit at the table and fix it. And so that leaves us to leave our family, to leave our jobs, to leave whatever we're doing to go in and fix a system that we had no, no help in crafting. And so and it's very, very difficult because then the community is looking at us saying, I thought you were going to go in there and fix it. And so we have to begin to figure out how to negotiate, unnegotiate, do it in an unnegotiable way where the community is first and the system is last. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I'd like to ask Damon if um, the whole issue of crime and violence, police brutality, et cetera, those weren't the only issues that um, that, that, that were in 2001, that the groups were upset about, that the community was angry about. Speak to the other issues, please. And what, is, what can we do to fix some of those issues? I think the work that the Urban League just did recently, the, the state of Black Cincinnati, yep. did a great job of speaking to those issues. One of the, 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 the large, largely undone issue has always been the issue of economics. Uh, the issue of, of equity, uh, the issue from you know the undone the issue in 1863 was still 40 acres and a mule, right. um, and from there on the undone issue and uh, the unresolved issue in 1964, passage of Civil Rights Act was still economics. Uh, it is still the issue in 19 in 2015. Uh, it was the issue in 1968. So until uh, 
you know, we have this new thing now on, on childhood poverty, um, and, and I, I'm, I'm glad, well, we, we label it childhood poverty, but we know children are in poverty, it's the families, the parents. But calling it childhood poverty, I guess, makes people more apt to want to do something about it. So we have to address the economic issues um, that confront this city. We have to address education, um, yes, yes, the educational yes. system. In Africa, they talk about three-legged stools. So, so let's say there's a three-legged stool of education. Preschool promise is a good start for that. Mm -hmm. um, the next le uh, leg of it would be uh, economics and how we bring people out of poverty. And the other leg is employment. Uh, we've got to create employment opportunities, and so that's part of a three-legged stool to address the issue because, and I'll, I'll be quiet, because we are only one, and it's usually police incidents, childhood poverty is not going to cause the next <coughs> major civil unrest. It's not going to motivate people to hit to the streets, uh, but a police shooting will, and it won't be because our police force is just that bad, it'll be because we allow all those other issues to fester. Yes. And it'll come to a head when the next unarmed black person is shot or beaten by Cincinnati police. Thanks. So, so Al, one of the major pieces of the collaborative agreement was the Citizens Complaint Authority. How is it doing? How do we make it better? Well, the Citizens Complaint Authority followed uh, probably eight or nine different versions of police accountability measures in the city. I used to carry around a three ring, several three ring binders, uh, blue ribbon panel reports, all of which said we need good police accountability, citizen police accountability. None of those went anywhere. The citizens were always volunteers. They never had the resources they needed. The complaint authority does have subpoena power. It does bring police officers in. Uh, it does have a broader scope. For example, it's the Citizens Complaint Authority that uh, fielded all the complaints about tasers in Cincinnati, recommended changes to the taser policy, and caused our taser policy to match best practice after it had already been established. So that's good. I mean, to the extent they're looking at bigger pictures, that's a good thing. But it's still complaint driven. And it takes a lot of initiative for them to reach out and see uh, bigger pictures, and I think that needs to change. It's also invisible. How many of you have actually <laughs> attended a Citizens Complaint Authority meeting? Raise your hand. Yeah? Raise your hand. All right, just a few. And it's, it's just not present enough in our lives. And so they need to get out. They are starting to get out in the community. That's good. The statistic that Donna read earlier, that uh, pl police complaints are at an all-time low, may simply reflect that people don't oh, give it much don't credence. Complain. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that that's a measure of our satisfaction with the police. Um, so all I can say is that we need to really make sure the Citizens Complaint Authority is independent and strong. I think the way the people are appointed to it is what Iris was referring to as the politics, is causing less confidence in it. And perhaps we need to revisit that whole system. Um, because I think they have their own staff, they have subpoena power that's better than a lot of cities have, but maybe at the top we need to do a little tinker. So no, um, and, and this is for, for anyone on the panel, but no effort that was as big as the one mounted for the, to, to create the collaborative agreement, to create the, um, um, the boycott coalition, to create everything that was necessary in 2001, two, three, four. A lot of groups meeting, a lot of groups working, a lot of groups doing things. Are they still together? Are they meeting? Are we collaborating? If so, what are we doing? And if not, why not? So there were, Donna, you, there were many groups meeting, and I don't know what all the groups are meeting about, but if it was related to um, police reform, the collaborative agreement, and I just want to, I want to I underscore this. The collaborative was a baby uh, that the Black United Front and, and their attorneys dreamed of. 
It wasn't that the police said we were going to fix something. So I'm going to say it time and time and time again, because I don't want the will of the people to get lost in the word progress or the word collaborative agreement or when you hear we're getting better. I want you to understand that had it not been for everyday folk who sacrificed a lot, a lot. So I want to keep saying that. So there are citizens that do meet with the city manager. There are citizens that meet with the chief. Um, there are citizens that still meet around problem solving. Um, but it's not enough because the collaborative agreement is not uh, in the forefront, as Al just said. It's like the, the complaint authority. It's not in the front of people's minds any, anymore, any longer. And because we're looking at what we're looking at other people's issues, and that's great. And Mayor Luke, and we have gone to Ferguson, Reverend Lynch and I have been there four or five times. Maris and Al and I have been there four or five times. We've gone to Baltimore, we've been to Cleveland, we've been to New York. So we've shared our experiences. We've shared the work product to help other cities get, get it better so that the loss of life, and so that that first interaction, because of what policing science does say, and what other social sciences do say, is that when a child comes into contact with police, and it's negative, the probability that they will come in contact with the police again is 50%. The probability that they will have another negative interaction with the police is 50%. The probability that they will end up in jail is even higher. So it was our hopes and our dreams to stop that first interaction with police, and in particular with black citizens, because we were having the issues with the Cincinnati Police Department. So I, I, I am an advocate and an activist for the black community. And that's why we fought so hard, and that's why we continue to fight so hard for it. But if there are other organizations, Donna, that you're asking about their um, meeting, I'm quite sure the NAACP will. I see the new president and vice president are here. And I'm quite sure that they will be digging into where we are and what we're doing, where does the collaborative stand, and how can they support it and get their hands around it. Because you used to go to the NAACP and file a citizen's complaint. So how can citizens get engaged and involved and just talk about the collaborative agreement one-on-one, -on -one, person to person? What does that look like? Because you can take a complaint in your house. You can take a complaint in your business. You can help someone fill out a complaint form. You can talk people through the processes. The collaborative is a roadmap. If you just read it, how many people have read, read the thing in 15 years? It's more than I thought. I appreciate you all. So I don't know if there are other groups that are meeting around this issue because our daily lives are consumed with so much, Donna, um, and that we live and we have to go to work and we have to. It's just we're kind of schizophrenic around this thing. Well, there, so. is, there is an organization within the collaborative structure, the, the uh, partnering center, which was designed to facilitate community engagement, and we just never really got it figured out. That's a waste of money. Um, originally, our, our idea was, uh, you heard me describe problems, and we thought, well, we'll just take problems to the community level, we'll have a facilitator, we'll, we'll learn the Sarah model, which is uh, a whole system for analyzing a problem, scanning to, to analyze it and find the resources to apply to it and then to assess uh, whether the, your problem was adequately solved. We have this whole system set up for spanning the city and doing a lot of discrete problems. So people could enter it, they'd be involved in a problem that would be close to their home, close to their business, and it would, it would just naturally evolve. That didn't really work. And then we got into using the partnering center to respond to shootings and to take back our streets. And that was good, healthy outlet, but it wasn't problem solving. And meanwhile, the police were not doing problem solving. In fact, we had to sue the city for contempt and get the court to order another year of court supervision in order to get problem solving going for the city. Because this, I keep talking about it because it was so central to our effort to at least create a police tactic that would be race neutral. Doesn't get rid of racism, but it does force the police to use a tactic that isn't automatically biased. Well, what does get rid of racism? Totally. Well, that's, 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 that's the racism isn't my issue, it's your issue. So what does get rid of racism? And, and that's a great question. So what we have to do <laughs> yeah. is continually hold ourselves accountable. We have to use strategies that say, all right, was I fair or not? 
to the police or to the to the citizens. And in every interaction we have, we have to be transparent about its outcome, and we have to be we have to assess ourselves. And that's why I like problem solving, because you can see the results right in front of you. You can engage with multiracial teams, with, with multi-generational teams. You can assess exactly what, what, what you're trying to do. And eventually, not in one fell swoop, but eventually by continuing to act together in a neutral, equitable, fair, racially appropriate way, hopefully we'll someday get rid of racism. In the meantime, we hold ourselves accountable and we act in a transparent Agreed. fashion. So I know a little bit about uh, the Community Police Partnering Center, and, and one of the things that, that uh, the Partnering Center is doing is teaching citizens uh, about the SARIN process and how to go about problem solving in their communities, and also working with police in ensuring that problem solving happens. So Iris, this this is uh, maybe not Iris, but the, well, the entire family. <laughs> <laughs> so Iris, but you touched on it a little bit. You talked about the toll that it takes on, or the toll it took on you, mm -hmm. the 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 emotional toll, the physical toll, what. It, it, how difficult that whole period was. Talk a little bit about the emotional toll that that period took on you, that the whole organizing process, how difficult it was. Talk a little bit about that, and, and if you would do anything differently today. I don't think I would. I don't know if that was as emotional as it is now. Um, I think that um, working then, we were working through our group dynamics and working through what we wanted and what we thought we needed and how we could reform the police. Um, so I don't think it is as uh, stressful as it is now because it is in the hands of other entities and it is in the hands of our legislators and it is in the hands of our mayor and our city manager. And it seems as if sometimes that the voices are not being heard by actions um, that you see them take. And, and whether they're very small or they didn't intend to, the, the, the collateral damage that happens in the black community, it goes far and wide. And so policing is so huge in the black community. I wish we could minimize it, that we could think about other things. So I think it's more stressful now, Donna, than it was then. I loved being in the trenches. I loved working on this. I love that we had to be accountable to one another. I love that Reverend Lynch um, asked us, what does justice look like? Because we would say we wanted it, but what did it look like? I love that we figured out a solution to a problem. And I love it, that it was us that, that had it and made it happen. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. You weren't stressed out by us, so we don't stress you out? Oh, it was terribly stressful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and the, the, the original ask from the client was about economic justice. Mm -hmm. And I sue people. I can't sue to undo capitalism. And that's a problem. That's true. Because that's what we that's what ought to happen. That's true. And that's not a good So we picked a uh, bite-sized piece, which was still tough enough, just getting the the police under control and finding a way to make everything transparent. Remember that back in those days in two thousand one. The, the, the typical response by the police was, this is very secret work. We're behind a curtain, and you really can't understand what we do. This is top secret. This is really special. Uh, you're, this, this is just way above your pay grade. And, and that, was a, that, that was accepted. There are so many people in the community that just felt policing was like the CIA. And I think one of the greatest things we've done is trying to bust through that uh, notion and remember that the police are us. Mm -hmm. We are our own protectors. 
and everything about policing should be transparent, except for that tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of super secret things where they're chasing really special bad guys. But that's a really small group, and I don't really want special guys. So we have another member of the panel that I'm going to. Uh, who's going? Absolutely crazy. That I'm going. Who's go okay? Who, who's ready to come up? So each generation sees issues of the previous generation through a different lens. So while 2001 burns in many of our memories, some in the audience were just toddlers back then. Um, it's impo important that we share our knowledge and our experiences, uh, but it's also important that we listen and learn what they have to say about today's issues. And so I'm going to introduce you now to Brian Taylor, who is the a leader of Black Lives Matter Cincinnati. Brian. So Brian has fought against police brutality <coughs> since the early 90s. He served as a coalition organizer in New York during the daily actions for Amadou Diallo, in addition to Anthony Baez, and Patrick Dorisman. He's worked as a journalist, as a union organizer for 15 years, participated in the South African Revolution in 1992, and has been active in numerous social struggle, struggles for more than two years. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. Listen closely to what was said on the panel today because it is revealing. The captain said policing is a paramilitary organization. Who is the enemy? Who is the enemy? The problem with problem solving is that you aren't focusing on the problem, which isn't crime. It's criminalization isn't crime, it's the social and economic devastation that we face where we live. I repeat, your entire framework is still aimed at the effect and the uncomfortable conversation that is bubbling underneath the surface, that is Ferguson, that is Baltimore, that is Cincinnati is the cause. And that's where I want to begin. Well, I'll be drawn on a few facts that are commonly and communally agreed upon, basically. Uh, one is from the uh, City of Cincinnati Citizen Complaint Authority, which is an extremely important <laughs> and factual document for people to look at and, and gestate on. Another one is uh, the state of black Cincinnati, which was talked about earlier today in the discussion, extremely important. And another thing I'm going to use is this article in the Atlantic called How to Fix a Broken Police Department. Those will be the things I'll try to draw on. I'm a native Cincinnatian, and uh, I left Cincinnati uh, when I was 18, moved around quite a bit, did some of the things that were mentioned. And I just want to start this by, by expressing a real respect I have both for the leadership at the time in 2001 and for the thousands and thousands of people on the streets that made the change possible. Uh, extremely important. Um, there can be no meaningful, positive relation worth pursuing with police or the court system as long as there is an unchecked and unclaimed violence and harassment by police in our neighborhoods. Police carry out acts of disdain, acts of violence, up to and including murder, and continuously, continuously, continuously are not disciplined for it. Many times, these acts don't even make it to court. Grand juries deem these murders 
not even worthy of trial. You have to digest this and understand this is our reality, even if it's not yours. If you haven't met it yet, and I understand it, I truly do. People here know me and know that I take great time and patience in explaining to people that there is more than one reality here in the United States that we live through. But there's one truth. And that truth is that police brutality is real in every single city. And that the recipe for the acts of violence that occur are still present in every city. Every city, every town. And it's an ugly truth that we have to face and fight and organize to fight. Um, some people try to say Cincinnati's fixed its broken policing system. It's a false narrative. It's not true. And I'm going to go into a little bit of explaining why I think that. Um, there's the Quan Davier Hicks story, which people probably don't even know who this is. A young man who was uh, basically gunned down. The police claimed that he pulled a rifle on them, which the whole community knows was broken. The whole community knows that if he was really trying to have a showdown with the police, he has a pit bull the size of a car, which he, did, which he left in the cage. This man was killed in cold blood, and the family still has not gotten the respect due to get the facts about the case and to get a satisfactory story. Still. And you want to tell me about community police relations. I want to talk about Satrice Costin, whose son was not killed, but he was brutalized outside of a bus stop, body slammed and tackled. Still, no answers for that family. We talked about Sam DuVos. I'm not even going to go into that right now. Enough people spoke about it. Yesterday, you can't make this up. Yesterday, at our Black Lives Matter meeting in Cincinnati, a family came to us. Melvin E. Murray Jr. His mother, Robin Scott, came to the meeting with her family and explained how their son was killed. He was, he apparently, according to what the police say, Failed to put on a turn signal, which led to a chase, which then ended with him crashing into a tree, and he was still alive. Cops did not do anything to revive him or help him. Instead, and this is on video, they ridiculed him and cursed his name. And the family suspects that, the, that he was rammed into the tree during the chase. Well, guess what? The bumper disappeared. Then the police said there was going to be an investigation into the matter. Well, guess what? A month later, the car was sent to demolition. So don't tell me about relations. There are none. There is, what there is is there are, there are people who talk about things, but, when you talk, but there is no real uh, responsibility taken for these acts. <laughs> we haven't even gotten to Sam DuBose, where the two officers who lied about his case are still on duty. I swear. <laughs> you gotta let that sink in. Two cops told a lie that could have made that could have made that police officer walk, could be on the streets today. And yet, and they perjured themselves. Well, they didn't perjure themselves. They told lies, and then when they got put on the stand, they told the truth. But they're not in trouble. What kind of, you got to think about these things. It's a preponderance of evidence that's showing what, uh, you know, showing these things. If you, I, there's double digit increases in claims of harassment. I'm talking 30, 40, 50 percent, not like 10 percent in 2014, according to these reports. Um, and when we stand up and try to protest these things, 
the departments go on TV and speak real nice about, hey, the support our rights to walk around and, and march, and this is what America's about, and this is what democracy is. Okay, two of our members who were marshals, organized marshals to keep people safe on the street, were given a citation. Two demonstrations ago that we had were given citations, taken to court, and charged several hundred dollars. This is intimidation. Dozens of cops on one of the side streets during the march who basically zoomed in on people with their cameras and their video cameras trying to intimidate people who were marching for their rights. Um. <laughs> Take your time, brother. Take your time. That's what I told you. <laughs> I'm going to finish, though, out of respect. Um, soon. <laughs> when Sam DuBose and Quandavier Hicks were living their lives, there was a meeting that was held at a church downtown where people stood in a room and talked about the police system being fixed and we're doing much better. This is so much better than it was in the past. And I said something then, and I'll say it now. The recipe for these things it still exists today. The same. Racism still exists. People are still profiled. I'm still profiled. People out in this audience today can tell you within the last three years of incidents where they have been profiled or where they have entered into a situation that they should have never been in, that was escalated by a whole series of factors there's not time to go into. But this is, this is part of what's happening. The last thing I want to take time to talk about, and then I'll close, and I'll be quick, I promise, is racism is institutional. <laughs> and thus, the police brutality that we're talking about is institutional. It's bound to the system on a molecular level. Which is why I don't spend time wondering whether this or that police officer is individually racist or not. Whether the captain is racist or not. I could care less. When you have a system that creates conditions where even the least racist cop objectively can carry out a racist act against somebody because they shouldn't be in our community anyway. That's institutional. Um, and there's a lot of facts around that that I can't give, so I'll just close <laughs> talking about um, it was asked to make a reflection, but this is not just a reflection. It's a projection into what we have to do in the future. And part of that is answering the question, where does our power lie? I believe it lies in mass action and movements on the street. It's from that action that these things happen. Collaborative agreements, other concessions happen because of social struggle. It doesn't happen because intelligent people craft documents. It doesn't even happen because loyal activists like Iris, like other people in this room, do the work to pull together 400 Claims, which is extremely important, but it doesn't start there. It started with Iris and other people like that, and myself, on the streets, making it clear that we will not accept any less than concessions. That's where it starts, and that's what we're building. We go door to door, we go into the community, and I encourage anybody here who's interested in joining a fight today to pull down the flag today that we have campaigns and things that we're doing, including uh, asking that the, or demanding that the CPD get out of CPS, including calling for uh, cases that have so-called been closed to be reopened. They're not, op they're not closed until we say they are. So demanding justice, even when you get a no indictment, even when you get a not, not guilty verdict, demanding that these things be retried is part of what we have to do today in order to change things. And uh, last thing, last thing. <laughs> but I tell you what, here, here's right. what we'll do. You all join me in showing appreciation to Brian Taylor for coming on. And making this
at the panel. You'll have another opportunity to make some <laughs> remarks. We have about another 25 minutes. That's all we have for this evening. These types of events, there is never enough time for everyone to say everything that needs to be said. There are mics in the middle of the room. Um, if you have a question of the panel panelists, please line up behind the mics and let's begin the, 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 the process of uh, questions and answers. But before I do that, is there any, anyone on the panel that, that wants to say anything about what they heard um, from, from Brian? I want to say to Brian um, and to all of those who are listening and connecting with people throughout the, the United States, and knowing um, that they're going through whatever they're going through in their city around police. I was just in Baltimore, Brian, um, with litigants and concerned citizens and their advocates, and they are so interested in a structure and how they can be in control of their police department. So my question uh, is to not just to Brian, but to anyone else, because I'm always uh, interested in figuring out a better, brighter, bigger way. What is it then that we're looking for, and what are you asking for? Okay. Well, and I'd also just like to say that if you've got any complaint against the police, please take it to the Citizens Complaint Authority. If you are dissatisfied, I sue cops. Give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> So, so there is no way that we're going to get to all of the questions in 20 minutes, but we're going to try. And we'll start with Sister Victoria. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, just a couple of things. Number one, I'm, I'm listening to this conversation and it seems so peaceful and so light. And it was not like that back then at all. Someone said they know, that several groups were meeting and all this. No. Every year, starting from Lorenzo Collins in 1997, there was another activist, another group that formed, more voices came to the table. I think Mayor Lucan had mentioned that they pretty much ignored the voices. Many of us were down at City Hall long before the restaurants closed and we were talking about the racism that exists in this city. Not only the racism, and I hear, I hear it being touched on, and I'd like the panel to touch a little bit more on the social economic issues. Our fight back then was about police, but when you peel the onion, you know that it's dealing with economics and rooted in economics. We were, we were called economic terrorists by Mayor Lucan because they were still ignoring us. Even though they tore the streets up, they were still ignoring our call for justice and change. And it was around economics. We got police reform, and that's good, but the economic piece around health disparity. Are we still not talking about that today? Yeah, that's right. Around education, are we still not talking about that today? This city has been traitorous to its people, and particularly African American communities, because we talked about infant mortality. We brought that to the mayor's attention. And, and at the time, uh, the current mayor, uh, Cranley, was back there as well. So he was also one of the ones that ignored the call for justice at that time. And economically, we still haven't been done. What we got was gentrification. And I'm still angry about it today. Over the line did not look like over the line looks right now. And so we didn't get that piece, which was economics. We called it economic apartheid, is what we called it. And that's what's going on in this city. Have you heard them talk right now today about not only the infant mortality rate, which mirrors third world countries. Mm -hmm. But they're talking about childhood poverty, which Reverend Lynch mentioned, That's a family. it's about families being in poverty. So we really never really got justice. It was almost as if we got police reform and they said, okay, you all, we can all go home now. So there's still people that are pissed off about how we're living right now today. I know I am. You ask where some of the activists are and have been. I was one of the ones that helped start the National Action Network that is but run by Reverend, uh, Reverend Sharpton. And so they weren't around at that time. I've also joined with the NAACP and tried to get that up and running to start answering some of the things that are going on. So, so we're still out here. We're not gone anywhere. The, the problems that we have still exist. But what I would say for the younger people that weren't there back then, please do your research. All you have to do is Google Cincinnati riots 
And everything will come up for you. You need to study that. Study what happened. Study how we were ignored by our own elected officials. And it's a sitting whole these lot of information. They sit in those seats and then they ignore you. So don't be ignored. You all are going to have to pick up that gauntlet and keep moving it forward. Thank you. Thank you. said a lot of things that need to be said. I'm going to go to this side next for the next question. Uh, my name is Justin Jeffrey. I'm the Greater Cincinnati Homeless Coalition, and my question is related to uh, what Sister Victoria just said. In this city, part of the response to the uprisings was to privatize our planning department. Uh, hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars have gone to gentrify the urban core. A uh, billion dollars has been invested. Uh, meanwhile, we see on the one hand, there's talk of a renaissance in Cincinnati. On the other hand, number two for child poverty, um, how does that relate to the, on, the ongoing struggle to pr improve police community relations? Anyone on the panel? Yeah, I, I think it's part of the mistake we always make. It's the same mistake we made in, in the 60s. We have the civil unrest, we fight the police brutality, but really don't, again, get to the underlying issue. So you come out of the police and the white community always win. So you come out of it, Police get more training, more toys. Uh, first time they came out of it, they got tasers. So they get training, toys. Taser uh, company becomes multi-billion dollar company. Happens 15 years later, police get more training, more toys. Now they get body cameras. Body camera company becomes billion dollar company. The communities, the community the, the, that were in mired in poverty, mired by being over-policed, get nothing. What we get is, quote unquote, police reform, but it, we never address the economic issues, the, the poverty issues that, that happen in those communities. So too often coming out of it, we get pacified to some degree with you know a collaborative agreement or, or, or some kind of injunction, but we never get down to, to where the rubber meets the road. And so, so to that end, people like Brian and all you younger people out here and older people too, but you got to continue to fight. So the same way we brought 3,500 people together for some policing stuff, let's bring 3,500 people together to change the economy in this city. Come let's come together as a community because we're losing. I spent the last 25 years of my life in Over the Rhine. I left feeling, I told Tom Dutton this the other day, I, I, I lost. I left feeling defeated. That's right. I still hear Linda Brock in my ears. Damon being poor takes up all my time. I left there with people <laughs> who, who were over the Rhine when I went. They raised their kids and grandkids there. Over the Rhine to them was a community to raise their kids and grandkids. Same. It's now a community for people who don't have kids but are making their money. And probably the first time they have a kid, they're, they're going to say, well, honey, it's time we leave over the Rhine because it's not a place to raise our children and grandchildren. So we keep losing because we don't, we don't take the next step. And so the economic fight is the fight we have to fight. Well, well you know what, Reverend Liss, let me just jump in to say this. And so I don't want us to get it confused. Our focus was the police. And so if somebody else, we all want to jump in because it's easy. Because police are the front line. And so when something happens, it's easier to see that. But just like politicians neglect the poor, we do too. So it's up to us to advocate for them. It's up for us to organize around that. I'm not going to be saddened by the work that we've done for the past 15 years. That This is the roadmap. Just imagine if another group would have focused on that instead of trying to put it all on one organization. So I think these some of these conversations, thank you, Justin, for asking that question about Over the Rhine, but some of this stuff is in-house conversation, and some of these things, other people are going to have to take the mantle upon. Some people, I ask Al this question all the time. We talk about racism often all the time. I ask them, what do white people want from black people? Because they take everything from us. What is it that they want? I ask him as if he's the keeper of white people because that's what white people do now. What do white people do? So I ask him because he's a white guy and I want to know. What is it that they want? Why can't we have equity? Why can't things just be fair for us? So what I say to that, Sister Vian, thank you for standing up and saying that. We have to organize around these all these other issues that plague our community. So here's a very concrete, discreet thing that we should look at in light of this economic justice uh, concern. City just spent a million dollars for a Croson study. A Croson study 
is a fancy name for, based on a lawsuit, for a justification to do minority contracting. So they got the results they wanted. The city's now allowed to do minority contracting. So is anybody going to look and determine who gets those jobs? Is it going to be Turner Construction that has a couple of, you know, uh, showcase people in their, you know, middle management? Or is, is there going to be a movement to say, all right, stop right now. Make sure that real African American jobs come from all this money you, you said you were spending in order to create jobs. We used to have something in Cincinnati called PrepJet. And that was an apprentice training program for the trades. And we got electricians, we got pipe fitters, women were, were in it, African Americans, it's gone. City should spend money to reinstate that. We should organize to make that kind of thing happen. Those are good jobs. We should fight for it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. In Cincinnati Black United Front. Hey. If anyone hears that the Cincinnati police have been totally reformed, and I, I forget the, the language, but you know, it's, it's not. If, Brian, if you think, if somebody told you or you got the impression that we <coughs> solved the problems, that ain't it, bruh. Look, just like Reverend Lynch said, we met with the NAACP, and they figured we passed the torch, symbolically passed the torch to us, and we took it, and, and, and you know, we carried it a step. But the fight ain't over. You ain't gonna hear me say the fight is over. As a matter of fact, I got a complaint. I need a complaint for him, Chief Isaac. Tonight, <laughs> and it's serious. So it ain't over. Every generation, that's what, that's what they told us. Every generation has to fight its own battle. At least, fight is part of the same battle. So stop criticizing the work that was done and just, you know, keep it going because the problems are still there. They're not going to go away. We did not solve them, and you're not going to solve them. Just try to move the ball a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make it clear, um, and I was very conscious uh, about what I said today. These are not critiques of what somebody did. In fact, it's the opposite. This is talking about the work that people have done over the years and how you get the most out of that. And these are not generational questions. It's not the older generation did this and the younger generation does this. And it's, that's not what it is. I'm expressing a political difference that some people on this panel don't agree with. Or some people in the audience might agree, don't, don't necessarily agree with. It has nothing to do with the work. People fought hard and, and won something, genuine. My, my point of, of all points is let's not have illusions in what the police are and what the institutions that create uh, police brutality are. They haven't changed. And so we are, this is, a, this is a passing of the baton or a sharing of the baton or however you want to say it, but within that there's always been a discussion, even in 2001, I was there in New York at the time fighting against police brutality, and it's the same discussion, which is uh, no matter what agreements or what things get codified, it's keeping in the back of your mind that your power lies in the street. That's it. There's no critique or bad-mouthing of anybody. That's just a fact. And it's been a fact since the beginning of time. So when we move, things change. When we don't, and when we rely on the structures that are part of our oppression, they don't. That's right. In the middle, again? Yes. I, I just want to say that I won't repeat any more of what Victoria said because I absolutely agree with everything she said. But one of the things, um, I graduated from Xavier in 1988 as a teacher. Yes. And um, my daughter did too. And my daughter is a teacher right now over here in the old St. Mark's School, which is predominantly African American. And she works hard. All those teachers do. But she sees a lot of these endemic things that this society has against these kids and it tears her up and I just want to make two things and I'll let somebody else do it but what we have to have Xavier UC Dayton Ohio State I don't care where it is 
they have to have some sort of programs and some sort of help, uh, monetary help, for people to go to college. I mean, we, we, we out at St. Andrews in Milford, which is where our group's from, we used to help send as much money as we could to St. Peter Claver, as you all know, down here in town, which was predominantly uh, African-American young men that we wanted to have a good education. That's gone by the way of the, I don't know, duck or whatever. But I'm just saying, whatever. It's not there anymore, and it really upsets a lot of us. Also, all I've got to say is, it's got to be, though, jobs, because otherwise it's poverty, and they have to have opportunity. That's all there is to Thank you. Thank you very much. And so it's a quarter of nine, and there's no way we can get all of the questions unless you are very succinct, okay? So can I get you to be very succinct going forward? Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 I'm Jeremiah, just a Xavier student, but I have a question for like anybody on the panel. Um, living in this quote-unquote colorblind society, can you speak to the fact that many of the problems of poverty and police brutality fail to be properly addressed because there's a deliberate attempt to ignore the racial history aspect in those problems? Young <laughs> I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Right, you answered the question. You, yeah, you said it. I would, I, would, I would much rather have a number of people make questions and comments, and then maybe at the end, each of us can comment on the jumping thing. Or, or so. Donna, if we can say this in the, before we start to move out. In April, we're going to have our own community police conference so that we can dive further down into <laughs> all of these issues. Because when we talk about police, it is an intersection of all the other systems. And so we don't get the opportunity to focus on the other systems. And so the, the schizophrenia of all of this baby is that we don't. And so when we come into a room like this, it's, it's really unfortunate because I, I would love for you to have asked, I love your question, but exactly this new crime strategy that was proposed this morning for the police. She's sitting here, the chief is over there, to ask more pointed questions of them. And then what I do hear is that, Sister V, we need to, Brian, have more conversations around these other issues that continuously plague our communities in the most egregious way. And, so and that's I, my answer to your question. Okay, it was a great answer, and I, and I really like the suggestion about getting all of the questions right. on the floor so that we can answer them all, all together, if at all possible. So I'm going to go on this side, yes. Hi, I'm Taylor Zachary. I'm also a uh, Black Saber student. Um, Taylor. Uh, yes, so succinctness is going to happen. Um, so, during MLK Week, we had an event here, right? Um, in the spirit of MLK, we held an event entitled White Power and White Privilege, Learn Your Identity. Um, the sad consequence of that event was such that with an attendance of about 50 black people, there were only about eight white people. So where were you, right? Um, how do you <laughs> learn about your identity when you are not in a space specifically for your identity? Um, so because, because we have such great access to uh, community leaders and because we are in Xavier University, um, I'd love for you all to speak about Xavier's uh, interaction with the surrounding communities and what does that mean for a predominantly white institution to be doing community work in predominantly black communities? Thank you for your question. <laughs> and in the middle, we're, we're going to take all of the questions. Thank you, Iris. Okay. My name is Gerald Beverly and uh, I'm a former employee of the Metropolitan Sewer District. For 23 years, I have fought long and hard for the racial discriminatory practices that are being uh, practiced there as we speak. I was forced out through them. I have my bachelor's degree of science and chemistry and mathematics. And throughout that 23-year period, I was never promoted other than the fact of uh, 
be taking a test and becoming a plant operator, but there is a need for a federal investigation throughout this city because it is very, very racist. Uh, my name is Deshayla Mitchum. I'm a Xavier student and I'm black. Woo -woo. But um, <laughs> I just want to, I wanted to bring up the fact, like some people touched on it today, the education in Cincinnati, because as a graduate of a predominantly black high school, to see the like, the terrible state that it's in, that they don't have textbooks, that the cops harass them, that it's, it's, it's terrible. And to, to see it firsthand, I just wanted to get any advice that I could do myself and that my friends and anybody else who's graduated and was able to get to higher education, to come here and feel unprepared and uneducated, like, is there anything that I can do to help those under me? Great question. Woo! Absolutely great question. Yes. I'm Brian Gary, and um, very uh, quickly here, I wanted to just clarify a couple of things and give a special shout out to Bishop Scott here, who was the leader of the Coalition for a Just Cincinnati. Right. There was another group, you know, there were other groups. We were the and I was the media coordinator, and we were the group that called for the artists and entertainers to cancel their performances in Cincinnati. And so we were the group who got Bill Cosby to cancel. We were the group that got Whoopi Goldberg to cancel, to, um, you know, Wynton Marsalis and, and, and various people. So there was another aspect uh, to the boycott, and it cost the city millions of dollars, and we were sued, actually, by the Aronoff Center, and ultimately, we sued them and won, and Bishop Scott has the papers with him. But, um, yeah, he kept all those for so many years. But what I wanted to clarify was that at District 1, when the so-called, what some people are calling riots, which was absolutely a rebellion, because rebellion is a result or a reaction to oppressive circumstances, that we were actually very quickly, okay. what happened was the police attacked a peaceful crowd at District 1. The night that Reverend Lynch and many other people were at City Hall and basically locked down City Hall, while they were there, there were about 35 of us and, and, and Dwight was one of them, and we left District 1 and walked down into downtown and back through the West End. And When we got back to District 1, we had a thousand people because the people felt what was going on. But I just want to be clear that it was not, that by and large, it was a rebellion. It was a peaceful protest against unjust circumstances. And Thanks, it's the, Brian. And it's the uh, solution to these, which is social and economic justice, is why I'm running for state representative. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> yes, sir. Good evening. Good evening. It's my pleasure. <laughs> I know Iris already warned me because she knew I can't get it going. <laughs> the thing is, uh, when we have events such as this, I think you need to have all of your facts together. I've heard so many things were, were half true, half false. This boycott that we had that spurred on the beautiful work that the Black United Front done and everything was one of the demands of the boycott. And just for clarity's sake, I will leave with you a copy, the entire copy of all four demands of the boycott. So when you decide to do something else, it doesn't become a dog and pony show. Thank you. Sir. Hello, my name is Philip Stevens. I'm a uh, business owner, a uh, long-time uh, resident. I uh, sat on uh, numerous uh, committees and over the Rhine, uh, ULI study, the abandoned building company, and we, uh, there were, you know, we, 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 we ushered in, uh, we, when I sat on the committee, I thought that we'd have more inclusion from the neighborhood and the neighborhood contractors and developers. But of course, that hasn't happened, and, and, and the neighborhood is slowly being displaced. And it's so strong, it's strange. I thought uh, former Mayor Lucan would be on the committee because all of a sudden, after the riots, there was first there was no money. We were trying to create jobs and do development and get things done to in order to create a vibrant, uh, self-sustaining community. There was no money. There was never no money. Now all of a sudden, 
out the rise. All of this money comes from nowhere. I mean, everything moves slow when we talk about fairness, <laughs> opportunity. Everything moves real slow. But you know, over the rhyme, all of a sudden things are in warp speed. This money is falling from everywhere. I can't keep up. Now, hey, uh, Pastor Lynch, you know, I just feel like the, the, the wagon is getting surrounded. I'm the last of the la I'm the last Mohegan in a lot of ways. I uh, I've tried to do development, can't get it done. I started this this if you, you know me, man, little can you catch you know me? I'm 53 now. Started out climbing on these buildings when I was 16. I've been trying to do development all my life. It has taken this much time. Now all of a sudden we, we, we see 3CDC, all the development happening, the, 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 the cost per square footage sky high. Where is the money coming from? Can we get access to it? Can we get the help we need in order to have some businesses that reflect the community, that reflect the West End, that reflect the population of the city? It's, a, it's, a, it's, important. it's important to the leaders. See, the, the leaders don't want to be responsible. It takes a particular type of guts. You know, you can't be a coward. You take, you, 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 if you take leadership, you have to be responsible to your constituents. You have to be responsible to the residents. You must create, you, you have to, you can't keep looking at these numbers and act like they don't exist. You can't keep picking who you want to demonstrate to us that something is happening. It's kind of like, it's, it's the old story. Yeah, you know, we all are busy doing something, but the evidence show we ain't doing nothing. And we gotta, and, that, and that's what we're charged with as a community. We can char we were charged with creation, to create things. Now, I'll tell you this. We talk about riots. We talk about, I remember I was in one meeting one time. The guy said, uh, so, pro I got to say, it's prominent leader. Don't go around. Don't go around. Don't go around. He says, uh, they're nothing but a bunch of terrorists and uh, 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 criminals. And, and I, said, I said, hold up, man. You know, I, I found fathers, they believe Jefferson and Monk one. I didn't believe that when, when, when the government is against the people, it ought to be not necessarily overthrown, we use that terminology, but it ought to be challenged. We ought to riot. We're supposed to be in the streets. We're supposed to force change. And that's what and, that, and that's what we don't do. I hear your it passion. Just goes, it, just, it just goes in a big circle. We have to do something. We, we hear your passion. We've got to stop vicious cycle. We, we gotta get development, we gotta have it, we gotta create jobs. Because that's the beginning of it all. We agree. No one wakes up in the morning. Everybody and absolutely and agrees. Everybody agrees. Yes, I'm Dr. Paul Sohi, and thank you for everybody coming here because we have a reason to be here. Um, if you were doing PhD in criminal justice at UC, you will understand the word concentrated disadvantage, concentrated disadvantage locations. Right around Xavier is Evanston. That is concentrated disadvantaged location. Right around where my mother lives is Madisonville. That is called concentrated disadvantaged location because there's nothing. There's no transportation. There's no grocery store. People have neglected. If you call 911 in these locations in Kentucky, you call 911 in four minutes, the police is there. This is an example of concentrated disadvantage. These are classic scientific studies and solutions that are available at, uh, you know, at universities like Xavier. I went to Loyola University, by the way. I'm a Jesuit. But, um, uh, so uh, there are classic scientific studies with solutions. Thank the you. leaders here need to study them and in incorporate them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kelly Prather. I am a candidate for the United States Senate. This is going to be a historic election because I will be the first female and the first African American to run. Uh, watching on the panel, watching my pastor, Damon Lynch III, and my social justice mentor, Iris Rowley, talk about the unrest of 2001. In 2001, I was on the front lines with Pastor Damon Lynch III, Iris Rowley, my church, and the community. 
calming the civil unrest or encouraging and fighting for justice for us. It's disheartening that I lived in New York for nine years, and when I came back to Cincinnati, I came with the thought of creating economic and power zones for minority. However, going down the city hall, going down the city hall and seeing how, how the resources are distributed, I, I realized that that's impossible. Institutionalized racism, Cincinnati is crippled by institutionalized racism in every market. My platform is centered around healthcare, Man. public safety, education, racial and, and increasing greater racial equity so that we can be empowered. African Americans are not asking for a handout. We are prideful people. We don't like to get hand, hand out. We are asking for a seat at the table where we can have access to the resources. Thank you. Thank you very You're much. Thank you. I wish you much luck in your bid. And, and you all, it, I feel like I'm being rude to the speakers, trying to respect everybody's time, because we're supposed to be out of here at about 9. Thank you very much for your patience. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Nathan Myers. Uh, I'm an educator at CPS at Withrow High School. Very proud. Proud, proud to support the Tigers. Um, but uh, well, I, um, the question that I really have is, is centered around the word trauma. Um, because at the end of the day, we're all people. Um, we don't act purely rationally. We have pain. And that pain man manifests itself in certain ways. And I, I see it. Um, I see it manifested in the lives of my students that, whose lives I'm entrusted with. So I'm trying to be a part of a positive, generative future for them. Um, but we're also talking, we're talking about police, and we're talking about uh, citizens in Cincinnati, minority citizens who have experienced trauma at the hands of the Cincinnati police. I think my question really is for uh, Captain Harold, because I'm, I'm thinking, the, the thing that comes to mind for me is the trauma that all the other traumas being taken into account for tonight that have been spoken. That Cincinnati police, especially the rank and file, experience trauma on a daily basis uh, with what comes along with their job. And I am worried, the question is about two things. Number one, uh, there is a lot of pressure within the police departments for police officers who see something that they don't agree with ethically that, that brings them pain and when they speak out about it, the department closes in on them. I'm thinking about the Baltimore police officer who basically was uh, excluded from, his, uh, from the circles of, of concern and safety there. But the second piece of that was how can we create, how are we working to create an environment where police officers who have seen pain, who are experiencing trauma, <coughs> some of which many of them are coming from conflict zones in Afghanistan and Iraq and are getting jobs as police officers, how, how are we enabling them to find healing for the trauma that they have carried into their job, the trauma they carry in their job, and enable them to thank, thank you for that very multi-dimensional question. And, and so, hmm? it, it is. Can you hold it for one second and, and we'll get to the last few. We only have a few more. Yes. I just had a quick question because it's especially towards Captain uh, Harold. So I just saw a speech of uh, Marco Rubio, and he says that the reason that like our economy and our government might get better is because the people in power just keep getting promoted up the ladder. So the problem is discrimination. The problem is the discrimination in the police force. What strategies are being applied by the people in those powers to make sure that the people have, like hired all all the police officers that represent our city? Uh, what strategy is implemented to make sure that they don't have a bias? Because if we can take out the bias in the police force, then we take out the problem of bias against the That's a great question as well. Um, the, the lady behind him. Yes. My name is Judy Alton, and I'm representing the Milford uh, Neighbor to Neighbor Group, Stanford. <laughs> You, uh, the panel has lots of questions to answer. This is not a question, it's a comment. Okay. 
systemic racism is a fact. We can't, we're not trying to solve that. In our little group, we're doing one simple little thing. For 15 years, we've been meeting together. We've been getting to know each other. We are putting a name and a face on someone who has a different color skin from us. And that goes, some of us are black, some of us are white. And we are bringing a little bit of peace to our community and coming against barriers, divisions, labels. We're simply sitting down and becoming friends. It has worked for us, and it could work for others. Thank you. One person at a time. Good evening. My name is Patty and Vaughn, and uh, like a couple other people here, I was a candidate for office in 2007, 2009, 2011. In 2011, I had the misfortune of being attacked by a police officer in an outlying community. I was arrested and put in a jail cell for seven hours, um, which I was eventually acquitted on all charges, but it happened to be six days before election, so just keep your eyes out. <laughs> My, I'm in the middle of a civil rights lawsuit now. I'm a plaintiff pro se because I've had trouble keeping attorneys that would fight this Hamilton County uh, system that starts with the police, goes up to the prosecutor, goes up to the courts. Uh, something I've discovered is the thing about sovereign immunity and police immunity, and that's one aspect that I would like Mr. Gardstein and Captain Hurl to uh, speak to. The other thing is that if an officer assaults somebody and they're required to put something down as an excessive force but they fail to do it, and then you go to the Justice Center and your records disappear even though you've re reported an injury, there's some problems in our system when that can happen. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Iris, I hope that you're making notes about some of the questions because yes. those are some of the sessions that we that that you may want to consider in April. So yes, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Good evening. Um, there's just I just want to make a couple of statements. I want us to not be referred to as minorities. I'm not minor. Thank you. We are not minor. I'm black. I'm African American. I'll be a Negro. I'll even be colored. But I will not be a minority. And that needs to stop. Because what happens when you do that, you diffuse our struggle. You diffuse our movement. Our movement is real. Our struggle is real. And it is valid in America. So as I leave you, that's my statement for you. Thank you. Thank you. And our final question. Hello, my name is Alexander Shelton. I'm a student at the University of Cincinnati. Um, and Sam DeMoos was killed at our university. That was the fourth um, unarmed black man or that was killed at the hands of the UCPD. This is the only um, university that has killed this number, unprecedented number of black people. Um, and so then my question for um, the people that, the civil rights leaders that are passing the torch. So it, it, when 2001 happened, these were unarmed black people, black men. And so these are people fighting against the, the police, or not fighting against the police, but the police um, attacking them. So students on campus or in, or black people around universities are now being attacked. And so then, when we talked about the, the realities versus the truth, um, your black counterparts in your classes are suffering. They're suffering from anti-black racism, from brutality, and from the trauma that's in the media. My question is, how do we rally together on university campuses to push the agenda for black people? Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Alex, Thanks, for an outstanding final question. What I heard in a number of the questions was frustration, and frustration with the, the issues of um, um, economic um, opportunity, a lack of economic opportunity. I heard frustration with the police department. I heard frustrations with the school system. I heard a number of frustrations. 
Would any of you like to address it? And we have probably another five minutes. Well, five minutes. We want to hear from Captain Harris. Let me just start by saying that, yes, there's a lot of frustration, but we are trying to have a extended conversation through April about all of these issues. So the people who are connected to Xavier talk to Gabe, talk to Sean. Uh, there are a number of us that have suggested things that Xavier students could be doing in terms of assessing the climate between now and April, in terms of doing some polling so that we see what kind of progress we've made, in terms of helping Maris hone some of these problem-solving projects so that we're getting our getting in the weeds and really working on things together. There's no greater uh, unifier, this, as testified to by the by the neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor people, than doing something together. And we have plenty of stuff to do together through the partnering center, through the, through the problem-solving efforts, and then to report out, maybe in April, through the uh, program that IRIS is putting together, April 14th to the 16th. So yes, there is frustration, but also yes, uh, we have time to work on it in a concerted way right now where maybe we'll feel a little more hopeful if we stick to it and not just walk away tonight. Could we give the captain a chance fight? to speak? Uh, you want to fight? I don't care what your ethnicity is. Hold on. Uh, Maris was, was just oh, talking. Chair just yeah, I, I, asked, I asked him to speak, please. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go on. Um, if you want to fight, if you want to be in the streets and make change, if you want to join the families who are trying to fight for justice against police brutality, join Black Lives Matter Cincinnati. See me after the meeting, and we can put some of that to rest. The other thing, and this is brief, mm -hmm. unlike before. That's okay. <laughs> um, if you are interested in, in, joining, in joining these, is contact me. Somebody asked about um, what to do about wages and our conditions. Black Lives Matter Cincinnati fights together with those who are fighting for 15 to raise the minimum wage. Those who are fighting against wage theft, which there was just a huge victory, a beginning of a victory that took place to, for, for workers who make what servers and, and construction workers make to get their money back. So we're part of those fights too, and you can connect with that too. Okay. So, Maris? Uh, the only thing I was going to say um, is... I really treasure everything that everybody said tonight, but one thing that I do want to impress upon everybody that's here, um, the police have changed over the last 23 years, um, and they've changed a lot. Um, this new generation that we are hiring um, is a totally new and different generation. It's a different culture, um, and I can tell you that uh, it makes me proud. Uh, these kids really uh, come to the table with uh, less bias, um, and they want to do a good job, and they want to understand the, the science behind policing, and uh, it's not everything, but problem solving is the proper strategy to use, and I can tell you that all of these police departments that we visited over the last several years that have problems, um, all of them, there's three things that come out in all of them. They're not data driven. They don't rely on data to deploy their resources. That's mistake number one. They're not transparent with the community. So like Al said in the beginning, they will not release information when bad things happen, which betrays the trust of the community. And lastly, they don't partner with the community and have meaningful relationships with the community. The city of Cincinnati is dil diligently trying to do all three of those things. So the only thing I do disagree with are the police have changed radically um, in the last 20 years. The biggest part of that has been the collaborative, and the biggest part is engaging in problem solving. And so I urge you, as we move forward, there's some great questions about policing that I would surely like to address in the next one, because there was some really good questions about the trauma from the community aspect, and also the trauma uh, the police uh, suffer as well. So with that, Donna, thank you. So Donna, can, can I say this? Um, to the gentleman from Withrow, is he still here? Yeah. Trauma? Yeah. All right, I sat next to a professor earlier today. She had to leave. Her name is Charlene Graham Bolts at NKU. And she just told me about there's a document that is out now entitled Trust Not Trauma.org. 
and it's about police and community, trustnottrauma.org. And it was put out by the Human Impact Partners. That's what we did that. So you may want to take a look at that, trustnottrauma.org. Lastly, the energy in this room is tremendous. The fact that all of you came out says that the energy that we had in 2001 still exists. The commitment for change still exists. And so we, we need Black Lives Matter. We need whoever else is out here still on the front lines. Uh, as I said earlier, we need those willing to climb the flagpole. Um, but let me say this. In, in, so we talked about this underlying issue of, of poverty, economics. So Cincinnati says they're, they're tackling it. And, and, and this, will, this will upset some people, but I've said it to their face already. So they said, decided we're going to deal with childhood poverty, which is how they named it. And they went out and they got Michael Fisher and Tommy Williams. And they started at the same place they always start. They didn't start with you. They didn't start in the community. They said, and we're going to attack childhood poverty, and, and we're going to need the CEO of Children's Hospital and the CEO of North American Properties, and you're going to end up with the same thing you always get. And so unless you organize, unless the community stands up and determines and declares how we deal with these issues, you're going to get the same garbage that we get all the time. You're going to get a, a gentrified over the Rhine. We were dealing with poverty. We didn't eradicate poverty. We just moved the poor people. Right. And so now they're all in Price Hill and up Glenway, and we just moved them. And now everybody's saying over the Rhine is a renaissance. The New York Times is writing about it. It's garbage. And so now they're doing the same thing over right in front of you, right in front of our face. So we've got to we've got to organize. Same way we dealt with police issues, we got to come together. 3,500 strong, 3,400 strong, 5,000 strong. We need people in the streets. And then for those of you in the streets, one of the biggest mistakes that I've made in my life was thinking you can go from in the streets to inside. And so from in the streets to being a can commissioner. That lasted for about, what, two months? And they, they fired me. So if you're going to be in the streets, you're, that's where your power is. It is almost impossible to go from activists in the streets. Because what they will do then is, oh, wow, he, he's important. And people follow him and people listen to him. So we're going to take him and put him on the commission or put him on this. You lose your effectiveness. You lose your power. So for you young activists out there, everybody doesn't have people in the room you can trust and count on, but if your job is to be out there pushing the envelope, that's where we need you. So, Brad, let me just say this. We're not passing the baton just yet. That will happen in April. The young guns are building themselves to understand exactly all of the nuances it took, that it took for the Black United Front and other organizations to come up with such a wonderful document called the Collaborative Agreement. I am not a leader. I am a wife, I am a mother, and I'm a taxpayer that wants a return on my tax dollars for my community. So let me wrap up by saying that, that there are a number of different issues that we need a collaborative process on, that we need a collaborative agreement on. And as a member of the Cincinnati Collaborative on Childhood Poverty, I can tell you firsthand that it is not going to be garbage. That it will See, absolutely. No, don't, you don't have to defend. No, 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 no. I'm not being defensive. I'm saying that the, 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 it will not be garbage. And I am wrapping up by saying. Let's make a bet. That, <laughs> that my hope is that we swiftly identify and deploy all of our collective resources to that end. And to that end, I'd like to say a huge thank you to each and every one of you who's here, and to Father Graham, and to Xavier University. And we have another 10 minutes that the building is open that you can talk to any panelist that you want. Thank you for coming.